Also, we're here at the National Armor and Cavalry Collection at Fort Benning, Georgia, and I have the preeminent German World War II tank expert, Hillary Doyle. And we're going to go through and pick his top three panzers here in the collection and tell you a bit about them. Okay, this is the, my number three pick for a tank of the Second World War from the German side. Uh, Panzer G, uh, with the chin mantis, which was the design that prevented the shells bouncing in through the roof into the driving compartment. Uh, the front armour is 80mm thick, the side armour 40mm. And uh, the Schutzen plates ran down along this side here, they're fitted here, between the gap here on the sponson and the wheels, and that protected this 40 millimeter plate that could be penetrated by the Russian anti-tank rifle. Not that it would necessarily uh, disable the vehicle, but it caused obviously injuries to the crew, damage equipment inside. So looking at the interior of this, it's uh, got your driver's position is here with the instrument panel there and we see the back of the radio racks because on the far side of the gearbox is the position for the radio operator who also operates the whole machine gun. Moving to underneath the turret, we can see the drive for the turret is down here, taking for, uh, from the uh, main transmission shaft. And here we see the elevation and traverse mechanism for the turret and for elevating the gun. Up at the top, we see the commander's position. So the gunner sat here roughly in line with this uh, and the commander behind him. This is a bin for uh, uh, the spent cartridges go into the bin uh, to cut down the amount of fumes in the vehicle. The suspension is torsion bar, double torsion bar, and the, we have the full interleave uh, suspension with two inner wheels close together and an outer wheel and an inner wheel, uh, giving a very good um, display of the weight onto the track and giving a very good cross-country performance. So that's why I think this is a good package. It's um, in its final version, the Astro F, it had an even better turret than this and there were various other improvements that they were bringing in. And while the original ones weren't that reliable, the later ones are very, very reliable. If they were used in the correct way, they would have been really uh, fantastic. And if you had a, a panzer attack with the proper battalion of these, it would have been very successful indeed. This is my pick uh, as a number two panzer. It's the Sturmgeschütz. And why do I pick that? I, I pick it because this is the vehicle that uh, had the high, one of the highest kill ratios, and it was one of the most numerous uh, panzers in the whole of the German arsenal. It's a defensive weapon. It has a limited traverse gun. It in many ways is relatively primitive because it was designed back in the 1939 period, but it was gradually upgraded with the long gun and the final version, which this is, had this coaxial machine gun in the mantlet. This mantlet is called the tough blender. It's a cast mantlet, but you also had a, a mantlet made out of uh, 50 millimeter uh, welded fabricated mantle. They were interchangeable. If this one has an 80 millimeter front plate, uh, but at a 10 degree uh, angle rather than the slope angle. But it has the suspension of the Panzer III, which is torsion bar, very good weight distribution, very good uh, cross-country performance, and the silhouette of this vehicle is very, very low, which gives added protection of the uh, effect of these was uh, the thing that mattered. They were able to destroy many, many Allied tanks if they were used in their original role as a defensive weapon, not if they were used in offense because they can't traverse the gun. Yeah, this is my number one pa Panzer. Uh, it's the Panzer III. And why I choose this is it is the culmination of several years of design work by the Germans. First of all with the Panzer 1, then the Panzer 2, and then with the Panzer 3 they introduced the torsion bar suspension, which gave a very, very smooth ride. The vehicle itself is a nice balanced vehicle, 
and uh, in this version when it started its life this is the uh, was originally an Asprong F so there's a lot to learn from this vehicle this is an Asprong F in its original form and it had a pre-selector gearbox uh, designed by Maybach which was designed to make it easy for uh, troops that have never driven a motor vehicle to, to drive this vehicle so very very good you can select the gear that you think you need on the next hill but to look at this vehicle this um, vehicle would have been built in 1939 or early 1940 um, it has then been upgraded with extra armor plate bringing it up to 50 millimeter basis the extra armor plates on the hull and the machine gun ball mount here is interesting it has this very wide circle in it because that ball mount will take uh, MG34 but the normal infantry MG34 so what they did you could slide a normal unarmored barrel MG into that and you had a kind of a clamp that went around and filled the hole that's why it's so big this type of visor was the earlier type of visor from the Osmerum F it closed up and down and then on the turret we have uh, well a, a later turret it's an Osmerum G turret uh, because this has been uh, rebuilt many, many times and was captured in 1945. This one has been upgunned with the 5 centimeter L60, but this same turret would have started life with a 37 millimeter pack uh, and two machine guns, which was the original configuration. Here we even have the original drive sprocket with the this type of openings in it. And it was designed originally to use the narrow track that was on these and here we see an extra uh, filler has been put in to make it wide enough to take the later track the original ones had what was known as 38 millimeter wide track a uh, 38 centimeter wide track and this is 40 centimeter track they had an escape hatch on either side for the crew that are in the hull to get in and out, although the driver could get out through the front escape hatch. This one, a G turret, has a um, more upgraded cupola on it for the commander with periscopes, and it's a very nice vehicle inside. Plenty of room, plenty of uh, um, ability to fight in the vehicle very comfortably. For that period of time, it has a 120 uh, HL120 engine. Uh, producing 300 horsepower, so a very good cross-country performance. Obviously, the first of these was used in the campaign in Poland uh, in small numbers, but then in France uh, it came into its own. It was very successful, very mobile, and it also was very successful in the early days in, in Russia before the advent of large numbers of T-34s. And even with the small guns that they had in those days, the 5 centimeter L42, they still could knock out a T-34, but they had to be more uh, nimble about it and you needed more well-trained crews. The problem also was over time, with the, as the years dragged on, they lost more and more of the experienced crews. So uh, you then had young recruits operating these vehicles who were not as well trained or as successful. Another feature of Panther III is the area inside the crew are all in the same compartment they aren't separated so you don't have a driver and radio operator down in the front the, the radio operator and driver are in the same compartment as the crew operating the turret so you have the gunner the loader and the commander of the turret and they're all basically in the same fighting room which makes a big difference especially in the days before intercoms were fitted so that me that perfect balance of tank, especially in that period, 1942-42. Thank you guys for watching Mr. Doyle's top three Panzer fix here at the National Armor Cavalry Collection. You can catch him next at Militrax 2020 over at Oberlin War Museum. And if you want to find out more about any of these vehicles or any other German World War II vehicle under the sun, why don't you check out his recommendation from his series? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we've produced now 57 Panzer tracks, which is the facts about each individual vehicle type uh, based on, on the our own research over the last 40 years and the research done by our predecessors like Walter Spielberger uh, and people coming out of the German uh, Kummersdorf testing center 
uh, and the uh, guy called uh, Becker who designed all the uh, conversions of the French vehicles. So lots of good stuff in the books over the years. On the Tiger II, which we're standing in, the books would be the ones from uh, Schiffer Publications. Go ahead and check out, I'll drop it in the links below, check out the Pins and Track series. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next time with more Hillary Doyle and more Bob Moon.